Good morning, everyone. Um, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is a verse that's very close and dear to my heart. It's a verse our family has learned to lean on. God has a plan. He has a plan in everything, and I'm going to share that with you today. I'm going to start with a little bit of history about myself. Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. My first memories of church, I was probably three years old. My grandmother took me to church with her. It was a small Baptist church in a town in Texas. I enjoyed those moments. I got to hear about God. My grandmother had a strong heart for the Lord, and she wanted to instill that within me. God has a plan. When I was four years old, my father passed away from injury he sustained in the Navy. Now, at four, I didn't have an understanding of what death was. I didn't understand it. I remember going to the funeral home and seeing my dad laying there, and I thought he was just sleeping. But in time, I would come to understanding of what that death meant. My mom became very distraught after my father passed away, and we moved to Oklahoma to be around her family and where she had grown up. We, she had some brothers and sisters there. God still has a plan. I had an uncle, he attended a Nazarene church and he drove the church bus, and he asked if I could start going to church with him so he would come by and get me. I remember Sunday school class being young. This was back in the day. They didn't have TVs or monitors. They had felt boards, little paper punch-out people, and images they would put up on those felt boards. And you had to use your imagination to get through that story and learn about Jesus in those moments. So, kind of in the mid-70s, and the Sunday school teacher one day was talking, and she was talking about, she mentioned that a man and woman shouldn't live together unless they were married, in God's eyes. Well, this kind of troubled my heart, because, see, my mom had obtained a boyfriend, and he lived with us. In fact, he lived with us until I was 16 years old. This stirred in my heart because I didn't want to be involved in anything that would make God upset. I was so young. So I went home and I talked to my mom. Don't remember exactly what I said, but I think I told her she was sinning. That didn't go over too well. <laughs> she became upset and didn't allow me to go back to church. That was so hard on this young heart. Well, I continued. I just, I wanted to hear about Jesus. Jesus, you know, our Heavenly Father, unconditional love. Christmas of 1976, my grandparents bought me my very first Bible right here. It's very worn. The cover's fallen apart. The zipper's fallen off. But it's the one thing I have left from my grandparents. One of the verses, the very first verse I ever memorized was John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Those words are written in red. Jesus was speaking. You can look in Jeremiah 31.3 to find that Jesus loves you with an everlasting love. As a youngster, I wanted to soak up everything I could about my Jesus. God has a plan. So a couple years go by, and I had another uncle that lived there in town. And one day while visiting with him and my aunt, they were talking about how they'd went to a little Wesleyan church. And they were kind of sad because they, had, they didn't have a Bible. 
they kind of wanted to read the Bible now. So I said, you know what? You, you can borrow my Bible. So I loaned it to them. And probably six months went by. And they came over to our home for a visit. They had been attending that Wesleyan church regularly and came to know Christ. And they brought me my Bible back because they had gotten their own. So my uncle talked to my mom and asked if I could start going to church with them because they knew how badly I wanted to go to church. So I got to go to church again. I was so excited. A little time went by, and for some reason, my mom decided she didn't like that pastor. So she pulled me back home again. I wasn't allowed to go to church again. I was devastated once again. So my uncle comes back to visit and says, look, we have a new pastor and family come into the church. Why don't you let Renee come back to church again? So very reluctantly, my mom said yes. This wonderful pastor and his family. One day the pastor gave an altar call. I went up, I turned my life over to Christ and publicly acclaimed Jesus Christ as my personal savior. The pastor's wife was a teacher in my Sunday school class. I immediately came to love her dearly. They had a daughter that was a little older than I was and a son that was a little younger than I was. Wonderful family. Well, one day I walk into church and sitting on the pew was this young man. He kind of caught my eye. I think I might have caught his eye too because he's right there. <laughs> So next month, we will have been married for 34 years. <laughs> Mark's dad married us. One of the things he had us do first as our first act of marriage is we took communion. I'll forever be grateful for that. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the cup of blessing that we bless is not a participation in the blood of Christ. The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? We started our marriage off with a firm foundation in a Christ-centered home. We established a faith that has carried us through today, continue to do so tomorrow and forward on. God has a plan. When we got married, I moved here to Wichita with Mark. I attended WSU on a music scholarship for about a year and a half. At that time, I kind of stepped back and kind of thought about things and decided you know, the music path wasn't, I didn't want to become a teacher. I have a respect for all teachers, but I didn't want to be one. So I decided to take a break and decide how I wanted to further ed my education. Well, we decided to start our family and I became a stay-at-home mom. So along comes bouncing baby number one, Jonathan. Then a couple of years later, we had bouncing baby number two, David. A couple of years after that, bouncing baby boy number three, Caleb. Our family was complete. Psalms 139.13, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. We praise God for the miracle of life. There's a strong love that a mother has for carrying the life that's growing inside of her, giving birth and raising that child. Children are such a blessing from God. God created us, but he specifically made us inside our mothers. He does everything with a purpose, and we must not only appreciate his brilliant work, but the gift of life that we have. Psalm 127.3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. God has a plan. When our youngest, Caleb, became school age, all three were attending school, I finally decided to return to college and get my degree. I became a paramedic. That's quite a switch from studying music. 
I don't know why I became a paramedic. I didn't have a history in the family of paramedics, firemen, police. Just something in to inside me told me to go in the direction of becoming a paramedic. God has a plan. <laughs> So after having extensive learning about medicine and the human body, paramedics are oftentimes called at, to people at a time of need. You're there for someone crying out for help, and sometimes you're just there for a listening ear. I've seen a lot of disease, injury, violence, tragedies, and death, but I've also seen miracles. I've delivered several babies. I've witnessed the miracle of birth, that first time that mother holds that baby infant. There's also been times I've went to patients where they're laying on the floor, not breathing, and don't have a heartbeat. So I've given medicine, CPR, shocked their heart, and sometimes they come back. That wasn't me, that was God. God has a plan for that person's life. I remember one of those situations, he was kind of a stubborn old farmer. On the way to the hospital, he woke up, and he was very alert. He looked at me, he's like, I don't need to go to the hospital, just take me back home. I wasn't going to tell him he was dead when I first got to him. <laughs> Sir, you really need to go in the hospital. God's in control. I really enjoyed working as a paramedic and serving our community. The small church we were attending, there was a lady that would frequently ask for prayer for a small child. She would give updates on the child's pro progress. We'd pray for this little girl in our Sunday school class and in our church service. We followed her progress as she was being treated at St. Jude. This little girl's name was Bella. This was our first introduction to Bella, even though we had never met her nor her family. But hang on, because God has a plan. Summer of 2013, we were planning a family vacation. We were going to go to Beaver Lake, camp out, go boating, jet skiing, tubing. So kind of a rough and tumble kind of vacation for the boys. But our youngest son, Caleb, he'd been having some hip pain, some leg pain, so I took him into the doctor to get him checked out just in case. And we didn't get to see our primary doctor, but another doctor in the facility, and he just looked at his chart. It's the year that Caleb had had a growth spurt, and he was taller than Mark and I, and he just said it was growing pains. Just go home and take anti-inflammatories. So that's what he did. We went on to have a wonderful family vacation. In the fall, we fell into our family routine. Mark was working at Learjet. I was a paramedic. Caleb started his sophomore year in high school. David entered college, and Jonathan entered the workforce. Things were going along. Caleb was in a weights class where he was weightlifting, doing things like box jumps, and he was having quite a bit of aches and pains, but we thought that came with the working out. Over Christmas break, Caleb told me that his hip was hurting him a lot. So I decided maybe it's time to go back in and get checked out. Now, the next day or so while I was at work, I stepped in a crack in the road, and I sprained my ankle really badly. That was a lot of pain. The doctor said it's better to break your ankle than sprain it for healing time. There's a reason for this. God has a plan. After injuring my ankle, I worked at our main office doing just paperwork Monday through Friday during the day. So since I had daytime hours, Mark was able to take off work and take Caleb to his doctor appointment. Well, they took an x-ray of Caleb's hip, and when the x-ray came back, it looked fine, the hip did, but on the bone at the bottom of the x-ray, there was a little bit of a flaring out, and they didn't, the radiologist didn't know if it was just artifact, but he wanted an x-ray of Caleb's thigh. So they had that done, and x-ray was back, so they called Mark and Caleb back into the office. And the doctor said, well, 
you can see on the x-ray that there's a thickening in the bone. He said there's a rare pediatric cancer. That was the first time we heard the C word. Didn't know if it was that, but Caleb needed to be referred on to an orthopedic surgeon. Prior to going to the orthopedic doctor, did all the MRI, CT scans, PET scans, and all that blood work. So it was time for the visit with the orthopedic doctor. I went out there with him over my lunch break. We sat there for two hours waiting, and I had to go back to work. Well, that day at work, I had my cell phone with me, but it was the day that all the telemarketers wanted to call. Auto warranty, they wanted my bank account, all those. So I just stopped answering the phone. And then all of a sudden I had a voicemail I was getting ready to listen to it, and Mark called me, and he said, we just got back from the doctor, and I'm having the doctor call you so he can explain it to you since you'll understand all the details. So I listened to the voicemail, and it was the orthopedic doctor. He said, give me a call back on my cell phone. So I did. The doctor told me, he just came right out and said it, Caleb has cancer. He said, and he kept repeating over and over again that it was really, really bad. He said it was something that couldn't be handled here in Wichita. He'd be referred up to KU Med in Kansas City and just kept reiterating that it was just really, really bad. I was, I was devastated. I left home, or left work, went rushing home. And the entire way home, I felt so guilty how did it get to this point? Why didn't I recognize it sooner the year before when he first started having the pain? I got home, gave Caleb a great big hug. He looked up at me and said, Mom, everything's going to be okay. He was so strong. He'd become our brave warrior from that point on. That was February 27th of 2014. It was a Thursday. So the orthopedic doctor had told us to wait at home and wait for a call from an orthopedic surgeon in Kansas City. Friday came and went, no word. So now the weekend's upon us. We had a big snowstorm that weekend. All the churches were closed on Sunday due to the snowstorm. The one place that we wanted to go and wanted to be with our church family, we weren't able to be there, but we did fall on our knees at home and seek God in prayer. That Sunday was supposed to be the last day for our pastor. It was a going away Sunday. Uh, he had developed Parkinson's and was going to retire and move to Kansas City to be with his kids. That celebration Sunday didn't happen. Our family now began to rely on faith like never before. It's our faith that would see us through some of the most challenging times. Caleb quickly decided that Philippians 4.13 was going to be his verse. That was a verse that he wanted to share with everyone, that he was going to do everything with the strength that Christ provides for him. When Mark and I left with Caleb to go to Kansas City, we didn't know what to expect. We didn't have a clue as to what was going to take place. I remember walking out the door. As we were walking out the door, I was following Caleb. And I was looking at him. I was trying to hide the tears in my eyes because that orthopedic doctor had told me, when he kept telling me it's really, really bad, really, really bad, he told me that Caleb was gonna have to have his leg amputated. So I was looking at my son wondering when we came back, was he gonna be without his leg? Now little did we know till about two, late day, or two years later, two years in time, the doctor didn't tell Mark that. I was the only one that he told that information to, and I had that held on to that for that length of time. So we got to Kansas City. 
met with the orthopedic surgeon up there, and she is a world-renowned orthopedic surgeon. She did a biopsy, and it wasn't just a needle insertion biopsy. It was actually a surgery. He had a four-inch incision, and they took out a biopsy about half a dollar size of his bone. This. She immediately put Caleb non-weight bearing on his legs, so he had to use a walker and crutches to get around. He immediately started chemo. Treatments were a week long in duration, and it was a week long of being hooked up and receiving chemo medication. He'd do that every three weeks. He had set for a total of 14 treatments. That was a lot of traveling back and forth up to Kansas City. There were a whirlwind of doctors coming in and out of his room when he first started his chemo. At in one given point, there were 25 doctors in his room. You can imagine how intimidating and how unsure we were of ourselves with so many standards, so many things were going on. And it was a lot of information to take in. See, chemotherapy is a poison. It's designed to attack and kill the cancer cells. The doctor told us that it was a very intense chemo as they give kids higher doses than they would adults because adults can't handle it. That's just a tidbit of information. Caleb had a Hickman line placed, a center line. He had two tubes coming out of his chest and one was for the chemo. The other tube was for blood products because the doctor said he would end up needing blood transfusions. Little did we know he would receive a total of 103 transfusions of blood and platelets. To those that donate blood, thank you very much. God has a plan. Caleb destroy, or chemo destroys the immune system and depletes it. You have to be careful of infections and monitor temperatures. After the second treatment, his counts dropped. He spiked a fever, and we were sent to the ER. They immediately started doing some testing, and the doctor came in and told me Caleb would have to be flown to Kansas City by Eagle Med. Throughout his treatments with cancer, he would be flown to Kansas City seven times by Eagle Med. June 24th of 2014, Caleb would have surgery. He would have a hip replacement along with a rod for his femur. This is the day that he had surgery. It wasn't the normal hip replacement. For six weeks after that, he had to wear a brace that went around his pelvis and down the side of his leg and kept him bent at a 45 degree angle. He still continued to use his walker and crutches, did physical therapy, and of course we had a wheelchair for him. After the six weeks, they did radiation treatments and a lighter dose of chemo, and that lasted for about six weeks. We traveled, we'd stay up in Kansas City and come home every weekend, but God has a plan because the American Cancer Society put us up in an extended stay hotel during our time that we were up there for those six weeks. We'd have a little free time as his treatments were in the mornings so in the afternoons, we would go around, we would drive to parks. Uh, we both took up photography and took pictures of flowers. We found animals to take pictures of. A little bit about Caleb was his smile. Everyone fell in love with his smile. 
He loved people. He had a very loving heart. He had a heart for babies and animals. He loved to hold little babies. And the therapy dogs that were at the hospital just gave him such joy. He was also our jokester. He liked to cut up and be a comedian. He loved doing imitations. God has a plan. He's working. So at Mark's work at Learjet, they have a motorcycle riding club, and they were going to do a benefit ride for Caleb. One of the gentlemen in that club that's a friend of Mark's knew this other riding club in Wichita, and he invited them to participate in this ride. This other club's called the 6-2 Riding Club. Now they came, they met Caleb, and of course they fell in love with Caleb. They learned that Caleb was a drummer, and they purchased a set of bongo drums and had them painted and had Caleb's name on them. This was the first time that the 6-2 Riding Club had ever done a benefit for someone, and it really invested into their heart. And Caleb was instrumental in that, and Caleb continued sharing his faith. So now the radiation treatments were over, and it was time to go back into his regular chemo. Sometimes the nurses would give Caleb a one-hour break from the chemo. They would unhook him from the IV, and we would go outside the hospital. We found a little spot that had a bench. I would wheel him out there in his wheelchair, and we'd sit out there, and he would just take in the fresh air. He needed fresh air. So we went out this one day and walked up to the bench. Now, I feel a little vulnerable because he's in a wheelchair. His leg is elevated. So going outside, you know, some t a lot of times outside hospitals are not the safest place to be. But I would take him out there, and the bench we sat at, there was a rather large gentleman sitting there. And I thought, it's going to be okay. So I went and sat down at the end of the bench, and Caleb was there. And this guy was fidgeting. He would not stop fidgeting. So I'm just watching him out of the corner of my eye, and finally he says, Ma'am, I just can't sit still. I need to pray for your son. That's why he was fidgeting. He, spirit was moving on him. He knew he needed to say a prayer for my son, and he did. He opened up his heart and prayed for Caleb. One day, when we were leaving the hospital, we were in the parking garage, and as I was wheeling Caleb over to the car, another gentleman approached me and said, I'm the pastor of such and such church. Do you mind if I ask what your son has? So I told him, he said, may I pray for your son? December 23rd of 2014 was the last day of Caleb's treatments. Blood counts dropped one more time, one more flight by Eagle Med, and he spent New Year's Eve up in the hospital, and he ended up having the flu. <laughs> During that past year, Caleb had been self-studying for school. A teacher would drop off his homework and then come back and pick it up, and she would give him his test. He continued to do that throughout the spring semester as he wasn't strong enough to go back to school quite yet. He, we returned back up to Kansas City every month for blood work and scans and doctor's visits. Everything was going good. On May 3rd of 2015, we had a celebration where everyone that was involved with supporting us came together and we were able to thank them. We had a cookout for them. The 6-2 Writing Club showed up, and they brought a leather vest for Caleb and made him an honorary member of their writing club. This group of individuals, they don't have the Lord in their heart, but Caleb radiated with Jesus' love, and they were continuously attracted to him and wanted to be near Caleb. At that celebration, we had a new pastor that came to our church, and that was the first time that our church family and us got to know that pastor. That was quite an introduction to be at the celebration and have our church family and then this motorcycle club there 
also. <laughs> May 16th of 2015, Caleb was asked to do a photo shoot for a Kansas City Chiefs calendar. He was paired with D Ford. This was an exciting time for Caleb and our whole family as we were all able to be there for that. Dee was really impressed with Caleb and he exchanged phone numbers with Caleb and they routinely texted each other back and forth and encouraged each other in everything that they were doing. Caleb was asked to become a Children's Miracle Network ambassador, which he did. This allowed him to share his story of his courageous battle with cancer and to help raise funds for the Children's Miracle Network to benefit the pediatric floor, purchasing equipment, supplies, and then assisting families. The fall of 2015, Caleb began his senior year in high school. He was excited to be back with his friends. He missed some days, but for the most part, he was there. December 20th of 2015, the Dream Factory of Kansas City, which is like Make-A-Wish, granted Caleb's wish and delivered to the house a set of electronic drums. This had been Caleb's wish. He was so excited. No sound. That was when he first got them. He enjoyed them so much, and that drum set sits right here now. His legacy. <laughs> God has a plan. God works. February 7th of 2016, this is a picture of Caleb playing, playing the drums at church. He enjoyed doing that so much. Prior to this, he had just recently found out that his scans, the cancer had returned. Cancer was back. It was now in his other hip, his pelvis, his back, and his skull. The cancer tumor on his skull was significant and when he was referred on to a neurosurgeon he said he, Caleb would need surgery. The plan was to remove the left side of Caleb's skull and put a titanium mesh plate there. Whew, talk about having faith in God. You know, I'm handing my son over to surgeons again, and this time they want to cut his head open. Faith in God. Our pastor and his wife came up to Kansas City to be with us during Caleb's surgery. Caleb and Pastor Mark had formed a really close bond, and this will come to play out shortly, but they texted each other daily. They would send Bible verses back and forth and just talk on a daily basis. They were quick friends. The surgery was finally over. The neurosurgeon came out and said everything went well and said in a little while we could go back and see Caleb. Well, we were patiently waiting and waiting and waiting. Finally, the nurse comes out and she tells us she's really busy at the moment. We can see Caleb in a little bit, but right now he was having seizures and she was working to get that under control. He had a total of four seizures. We were finally able to go back and see him in the NICU. When we got back there, he couldn't move the right side of his body, couldn't move his right arm, couldn't move his right leg. He was trying to talk, but he couldn't get his words to come out. They were mumbled. And I could tell he was getting really frustrated. He was trying to say something. And we just couldn't understand him. So finally I grabbed my iPad and handed it to him. It took him a few minutes, but he got one little sentence out. And I had to decipher the sentence because the words were misspelled, but he asked, why am I talking like this? 
So I had to reassure him and let him know, you just had surgery, you need to take time to recover. But in my heart as a paramedic, I thought he'd had a stroke. And I wondered what road would lay ahead of us at that point. They allowed me to stay with Caleb that night in his room. He started improving that evening, and by the next morning, all those issues had resolved. He was talking fine, clear speech, and he could move his arms and legs. God is so good. So once again, he started chemo treatments. And we would go up every three weeks, and this time it was outpatient. So we stayed at the Ronald McDonald House for a week, every three weeks, and traveled back and forth to Kansas City. And in the afternoons, we would go exploring, having fun. Once again, Caleb was self-studying with his schoolwork and trying very hard to keep up. On May 17th of 2016, 2016, after completing a week of treatment, Caleb walked the stage and graduated with his high school class. The 6-2 motorcycle club even showed up to his graduation and cheered him on. They were pretty loud, and they gave him a gift. The leader of the 6-2 riding club was friends with a gentleman that organized another organization, and he contacted them and told them about Caleb. This organization was Cause for Cause, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with. They'd never had a kid before. They usually had two people a year that they didn't benefit for, and this was their first kid. A lot of planning went into the event. It was held at an auction house, Items were collected for the auction, and they were looking for some entertainment prior to the auction as people were coming in, so I volunteered our praise and worship band, and they said we could do that, <laughs> and Caleb got to be a part of it. Well, just prior to that, a gr music group that we really enjoyed listening to is Denver and the Mile High Orchestra. Denver Beerman is the leader of that group, and he writes and composes music, and he takes the hymns out of the hymn book, and he arranges it in a big band style, in a jazz style, kind of like the music I play. And on his website, there was a contact area where you could email, and I thought it just went into a general email, but I sent him an email describing the cost for clause benefit, and... I know it probably couldn't happen, but would you possibly consider coming and playing? Well, he ended up getting in touch with me, called me, and said, I would love to come. Now, it wouldn't be his whole band, but he would come and play with tracks. So he showed up. Cause for Claws event happened. He is a phenomenal singer and trumpet player, and we went to church. We were there. Uh, there was a lot of drinking going on in the background, but they were hearing the message. Those seeds were being planted. Then in July of 2016, uh, Walmart and Sam's has their big Children's Miracle Network kickoff. Um, if you've ever been in Walmart and they ask you to purchase a balloon, the little paper balloon, that's what it's for. They have a big tent. They serve a lot of the Walmart and Sam's associates show up, and they have a little celebration to kick off their event. And we went there. Caleb, being an ambassador, shared his story, and everyone was touched by his story, and one of the local Walmarts there asked if we would come and share with their entire store to help motivate them and show them the reason behind what they're doing. God has a plan. End of July of 2016, Caleb was sent to MD Anderson in Houston. Uh, they were going to look at proton beam radiation treatments for Caleb on his skull. 
we would be there for an extended period of time getting those treatments. So we headed down there. He went through a week-long testing, um, all the scans, blood work, and everything. And we finally went in for the doctor's visit. He was a Ewing sarcoma specialist. And he said, well, the chemo's working. You don't need to do the radiation. So this is another praise the Lord. He's like, go home. Go back and keep doing your chemo. Well, Caleb was released to come back home. And we had to go see the ocean first. <laughs> this is one of my favorite pictures of Caleb. He's wearing his favorite shirt. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We didn't do it just one day. We had to go back and do it another day, too. We get back home, and a medical friend of mine had told me that Wesley now had two new pediatric oncologists, and why don't I look into seeing about Caleb doing his treatments back home so we didn't have to travel and we did that, and it worked out, so now we didn't have to go to Kansas City. Eagle Med decided that Caleb had flown with them so many times that it was time for him to have a fun flight. So they got the helicopter out and took Caleb for a flight. He enjoyed that one a lot more than he did his others. <laughs> one of Caleb's oncologists had previously work in, worked at Children's Mercy in Kansas City prior to coming to Wichita. Uh, at this point in time in his treatments, he decided it was time for Caleb to have a stem cell transplant. Now, they had harvested his stem cells way back when he first was diagnosed with cancer. For if he ever redeveloped cancer, he could have his own stem cells. So it was time for that. We were so thankful that they had had the insight to do that early on. December 5th of 2016, Caleb had a stem cell transplant. He was hospitalized for over a month. They gave him some intense chemo and depleted his entire immune system, and then they administered the stem cells. Now, when he went to Children's Mercy, since you're in there for over a month, they put up a theme in your room, and Caleb chose the Kansas City Chiefs. God has a plan. The Children's Mercy set up a snowflake workshop because it's right before Christmas, and they set it up so kids can come in and get gifts for their parents, and parents can get gifts for their kids since they're inpatient. Um, Eric Berry with the Kansas City Chiefs at that time donated $10,000 worth of gifts for this snowflake workshop. And he made an appearance when he brought those gifts there. Well, when he came to the hospital, he was allowed to see two children in the hospital. And one of the hospital workers said, you have to go see Caleb. He came to Caleb's room. He was so humble by Caleb. He looked around the room, saw all the cards encouragement and support and see Eric Berry had already gone through his own battle with cancer he was so loving on Caleb he didn't want to leave his room he kept gave, giving Caleb hug after hug after hug Caleb met so many people and was able to share with so many Caleb was discharged on December 23rd of 2016 that was exactly two years after his first discharge from cancer. The only catch is we had to remain in Kansas City for a month after a stem cell transplant. Now, our first pastor that I men mentioned that had retired and had Parkinson's, um, he had since passed away, but his wife continued to live in their apartment that was in a senior apartment community and they had had a son that had fought leukemia and had a stem cell transplant, and she understood the need to be away from the public and be in a very clean environment. So she offered, she got permission and offered her apartment to us so that we'd have a place to stay and didn't have to go to the Ronald McDonald house, and then she went and stayed with her kids. God is so good. That was such a blessing to have the luxury of apartment to be in. God has a plan. 
We would soon find out that our pastor Mark had prostate cancer and that it was rapidly developing kind. Caleb and Pastor Mark continued their daily texting encouragement to each other. The end of January 17th, or end of January 2017, prior to us coming home from Kansas City, the oncologist did one more bone marrow biopsy. And he came back and he said, I'm still seeing cancer cells. He said to go back home and see our oncologist here in Wichita. So our doctors here quickly got Caleb an appointment with the Ewing sarcoma specialist at St. Jude. And there was a trial that Caleb would qualify for. So on February 18th of 2017, we were off to Memphis. Did a week-long test, every test imaginable. Doctor came in with the results and said, well, I can't find cancer anywhere. All the testing, bone marrow biopsies, everything. I can't find cancer anywhere. Is God not good? We came back home. Everyone was excited. We started getting back to normal life. Mother's Day weekend of 2017, Caleb, being a Children's Miracle Network ambassador, was selected to be an honorary pit crew member for the Stanley car with NASCAR. The race was being held on Mother's Day. That was an exciting time for him and three other boys as they got to walk the red carpet going into the driver's meeting and be introduced to the drivers. And Larry the Cable Guy was there all the boys enjoyed him. <laughs> and then Joe Gibbs was the one that owned the car and three other cars, and they put us in a suite so we could watch the race. July 12th of 2017, Caleb was also a spokesman for the Red Cross since he had received so many transfusions, and they wanted him to come cut the ribbon as they were releasing a new blood mobile and he was very brave and he stood up there and gave a speech that night he got to throw out the first pitch of the Wichita wing nuts at the Red Cross night so Caleb and I continued taking a lot of pictures one day we went to the Cedric County Extension Center to their outside Arboretum area I was taking pictures and Caleb found a rock now it wasn't just an ordinary rock. This rock was painted. And it had a saying on the front. I can't remember what it said, but on the back it said, ICT Area Rocks on Facebook. And we looked it up and found that this was a kindness rock movement. You paint rocks and you leave them out at places hoping for people to find them. So we thought, oh, this might be fun to do. So we started painting rocks. Um... God has a plan. It's coming. Unfortunately, in July, God called our pastor Mark home. His fight with cancer was over, and this was a great loss to many and was very much so to Caleb. The end of July, Caleb fell on his right knee. He started developing some swelling in his thigh. Over a few days, he saw several doctors, and we ended up back up at KU Med in Kansas City. And on August 15th, the doctors confirmed that the cancer had returned. And it was pretty widespread. And they told us to come back home to our oncologist here. And we did. We continued painting rocks in between doctors' visits. Well, the oncologist got Caleb an appointment back at St. Jude again. This was the end of August. So I headed to St. Jude with Caleb. His leg was so swollen, he couldn't sit comfortably in a seat. So we had to fold down the seats in the van and made him a bed in the back of the van. He couldn't make the entire trip to Memphis in one drive, so we stopped at Fort Smith for the night. When we got up the next morning, the very first rock that Caleb ever painted he placed outside of our hotel by a planter for someone to find. And on the back of our rocks, we always had the group and everything, but we had 
hashtag brave warrior, and then hashtag P413 for Philippians 413. So we went on to St. Jude. When we were there, we put rocks around so people could enjoy them. And then on August 30th of 2017, Jennifer Bush posted an Icy Terry Rocks Facebook page. She stated, two cancer warriors found this rock at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. I was so excited because we are from Wichita. Not sure if another cancer patient from Wichita brought it here or what. Would love to hear his story, but it will be going back to Wichita with us. This is the post that she had. In the comments, someone else had posted to Jennifer, we recognize the rock from a picture. Jennifer had responded, wow, I hope she sees this. So I sent Jennifer a message saying that we we're staying at the Tri-Delta place. And we both realized that both of our children were there. Another comment under Jennifer's post was from a lady named Terry. She stated, I found a rock at Edwards Funeral Home in Fort Smith, Arkansas. It had been outside. I was wondering if Renee left it there or if it had been left by someone else. Oh, that was Caleb's rock. She said, I would love for her to contact me if she sees this. I am putting her son on my prayer list. Philippians 4.13, Caleb. I contacted Terry via messenger. We became friends. She never had the opportunity to meet Caleb, but I've been able to see her twice since then. She's such a strong Christian lady. We met another mother and daughter at St. Jude through one of his rocks and became close friends with them. I think Caleb kind of liked Cameron, her daughter. It would be heartbreaking one day later when Caleb would tell me that Cameron had passed away. Isaiah 26, 4 says, Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. While at St. Jude, one day we were waiting in the clinic to go in and see the doctor sitting there, and this young family came up to us and said, You're Caleb. They introduced themselves as Josh and Jennifer Bush, and they had their daughter Bella there with them. Pastor Josh asked if he could pray for Caleb sat right there in the lobby of this waiting room, and he, went, he prayed for Caleb. A nurse that was passing by, she stopped and laid hands and prayed with us. What a testimony and witness to that group of people that were sitting around in that waiting room. After he finished praying, it finally dawned on me, this was Bella. This is who I had been praying for before. The other church when the lady was asking prayers for this young girl this was Bella God has a plan in everything Caleb was admitted to the inpatient hospital there at St. Jude they worked on trying to get the swelling down um, they did scans and everything and the cancer was just coming back very quickly uh, they hooked Caleb up to a pain pump. So now it was time to go home. They said we'd go home and Caleb would be on hospice and he could try a low dose chemo to see if that would help keep things at bay for a little while. But the issue was how were we gonna get Caleb home? They didn't want me taking him home in the van like I'd gotten him there. So one of Mark's friends at work contacted the upper bosses up in Canada and told them about Caleb needing to get home. A Learjet was sent to Memphis to pick us up and gave Caleb and myself a 45-minute flight home rather than a 12-hour drive home. They even had a fruit tray and drinks available for us on the flight. When we landed in Wichita, the jet taxied over to the Learjet property and all the employees were there waiting to cheer Caleb on and celebrate with him, and then they took us on home in a van. So Caleb was now on hospice. He continued with his medication regimen and always held Philippians 4.13 as his stronghold. After a couple weeks, the swelling subsided some in his leg, so we decided to plan a short trip to Branson 
with him. While I was planning this trip, I very rarely checked this email account, but I checked it and I had an email saying Paula Dean was going to be in Branson for a book signing and you could email and try to get a meet and greet with her prior to the event. So I sent an email not thinking anything of it. And wouldn't you know, I got a response back saying I had been selected and I could bring one guest with me. So Caleb painted her a rock, <laughs> took it and gave it to her. And again, she fell in love with Caleb. And was so she spent like 45 minutes with him instead of 30 minutes. And she asked if she could sign Caleb's shirt. I know you could, can't see it there. He was all about his t-shirts. And that one said, relish sweet Jesus on it. So the ICT Area Rocks admin had been following Caleb and decided to put an event out there for people to mail rock, painted rocks to Caleb or give them to him for his 20th birthday because it was coming up. He ended up getting close to 2,000 rocks. Our poor mailman, he would come carrying a box full of rocks. <laughs> The day after t Caleb's 20th birthday, the Wichita Police Department made him an honorary police officer for the day. They had a special ceremony for him, swearing him into the service. Well, then the fire department had to step up and they made him an honorary fireman. <laughs> so me being an EMS, they couldn't feel left out, so they made him an honorary paramedic. <laughs> Christmas is closely approaching. The fire department came out and put, decorated the outside of our house with Christmas lights. Sedgwick County EMS arranged a special event for our family. They brought out a brand new ambulance and they took our family to Botanica to see the illuminations. This way Caleb could be wheeled around on a cot and be able to enjoy the lights. This would be the last family photo picture our time with Caleb was nearing the end. We spent as much time as a family with him in the living room because he was in a hospital bed. Christmas came. It was pretty quiet and mellow. Caleb's body was swelling due to the invading cancer and steroids. We were trying to make him as comfortable as possible. The night of December 27, 2017, I was in a recliner beside Caleb's bed. I didn't sleep at all that night. Caleb wanted to hold on to my hand tightly all night long, and I did. Early next morning, I noticed Caleb's breathing pattern had changed slightly. I went and woke Mark up and told him, I think you need to come into the living room. I climbed up in bed beside Caleb and held him close until he took his last breath and his heart beat for the last time at 8.15. There was such an overwhelming presence of angels in the room when God called him home. It was so peaceful. And yet I watched a single tear slip from his eye. You see, at that moment, God chose not to heal Caleb while he was here on earth. He chose him to heal him eternally. We're, you know, if you're healed here on earth, it's only temporary. We're all going to die at some point, but Caleb got the ultimate reward. There's a huge void in our home. There's a huge void in my heart and always will be until I'm again reunited with Caleb in heaven. I had a little daily calendar for that next year, 2018. And on January 1st, 2018, the verse was Philippians 4.13. So we were planning a celebration of life service. We had Pastor Josh officiate. We realized that it was quickly outgrowing the small church we were at. So we planned to come here. 
And then the mortuary said, you know, it's outgrown that facility. You need to have it at Central Community Church. We had a celebration there, and I remember at the end, each of us family members went up and said a few words. And I vividly remember going up there and looking at all the people that were there to celebrate Caleb's life. Such a variety of people over here in this section was EMS, fire, law enforcement, and they had all brought their honor guard to be there for Caleb. Even one of the police dogs were there to pay their last respects. In the middle section were all friends and family. And then over in this section was just flooded with motorcycle riders. They all had on their leather riding gear and yellow bandanas. He reached so many, and as many that were sitting here that day, there were so many more that he touched outside. When Paula Dean learned of Caleb's passing, she sent a video message to be played, and she sent a beautiful wreath for the service. She continues to keep Caleb's rock in her dressing room as a memory. Stanley Tools, the NASCAR organization, they learned of Caleb's passing, and they donated $10,000 in Caleb's name to Children's Miracle Network. The Wichita Fire Department had a pub crawl that spring. They raised over $7,000 and donated it in Caleb's name to St. Jude. He touched so many lives and hearts. Caleb knew, or everyone knew of Caleb's love for Jesus. Now, today, Caleb's vest that the 6-2 club gave him hangs in their club. They have their own private clubhouse, which is essentially a bar-type setting. But on his vest, Caleb had patches put on of Philippians 4.13 and patches with crosses on him. So that seed planting is sitting right there on that wall in that building for all of them to see. Caleb loved people and demonstrated the love of God to everyone. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Caleb had this trust in the Lord. His heart led this way. In all his battles, highs and lows, Caleb never once complained. He never, ever said, why me? Never questioned it whatsoever. In fact, one day, Mark, Caleb was talking to Mark, and he told him, Dad, if one person comes to know the Lord because of what I'm going through, then it'll all have been worth it. I believe that my mom actually gave her heart to Christ by witnessing Caleb's drive and passion for Christ. God's plan for your life far exceed the circumstances of your day. In Isaiah 46, 4, God is saying, I have made you, I will carry you, I will sustain you, and I will rescue you. There's always going to be a void in our family, but I cannot wait for our family reunion in heaven. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. After Caleb passed, I started working for Village Travel. I drove a tour bus for them. You get to know a lot of people, and... With God having a plan, every once in a while, people, they always want to know, how long have you been driving? And then, well, what would you do before you drove? And a lot of times, I could kind of skirt around the issue, but this one day, this gentleman, he's like, well, why'd you leave EMS? See, after Caleb passed, I couldn't bring it in my heart and go back and do that work. But I knew God had a plan. I didn't know why I became a paramedic. But I do know now because it groomed me and shaped me so that I could care for my son in his time of need. So this gentleman had got to the point, you know, how long have you been driving? What did you do for this, before this? 
are you married? How many kids do you have? And then, well, why did you leave EMS? And this was a day I did not want to share. I just didn't feel like sharing, but God had a plan. So he kept probing, kept probing. And finally it came out. And after we talked about Caleb, he said, you know, I've been really writing my son lately. I've been on him to do better in school, get his act together. I've really been hard on him. I just need to go home and show him love because it's not all that bad. Looking at what your sons went through, I just need to love him more. And most recently, a couple months ago, I had a doctor's visit and it was for work, a physical for work. And she was looking at my history. She started talking about Caleb and asked me about his story. And she's like, praise God. She's like, I just had a big fight with my teenage daughter this morning. I'm going to go home and apologize. It wasn't that big of a deal. She's like, there's too much to lose in life to stay angry for so long. Isaiah 40, 40, 31 says, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. After Caleb passed, I fought with depression and anxiety. It can get quite a grip on you and try to pull you down. But I just fall to my knees and I pray to God. For 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. It can be difficult to trust God during uncertain times. But as believers, we know that his ways are not our ways. And he will ultimately work all things for good. Having faith in difficult times can allow you to find peace in God's presence. So I leave you with one final verse. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. I was going to say something about 30 seconds anyway for me and my family uh, we'll never be the same here on earth and we'll always have a part of us missing but when we get to be with in, in heaven we'll all be together again and just like I I will be happy to be there to see my son again you know Jesus is looking forward to seeing us because we're his children too we're here on this earth and he knows what this crazy earth is like and how much pain is here and we'll all be one family up with the Lord that's all